evening. Welcome once again to Branko Broadcast. My name is Bob Branko. How are you this lovely Monday evening? We're very happy to have back on the show in a different capacity Stephen Seaburge, an author of the book The Metcha Message. But he's wearing another hat tonight. He's going to talk about his job as ADA compliance tester for the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everyone who's on the line. Um, I want to thank the Carroll Center for teaching me good mobility because I wouldn't have been able to do this job without it. So um, I've had this job for about 16 months. Um, the job interview was really interesting because they really wanted to make sure I had good, good mobility skills, uh, good problem-solving skills and whatnot. Um, then we had a two-hour training where they basically go with a fine-tooth comb on all the aspects of accessibility. Um, so what is my job exactly? Well, what we do is we all the testers have one type of disability or another. Mine is considered a um, visible disability because I use the white cane. So we pair up with observers which the observer's role is to pretty much document the whole trip and the issues that come up. Sometimes I have to write issues that come up on the trip. Um, so what we do is they give us a route, a crazy route. You're taking buses, subways. It could be four to six hours for a day. And so you have to know all these little ins and outs about, like when you take a bus, is the external announcement working? And if it's not, and the bus driver can see you, they're supposed to tell you this is such and such bus. Um, but it's not all black and white. Like sometimes there'll be three or four buses in a row, and you have to be at, have your wits about you and say, well, I hear a bus over there, so I got to kind of be, you know, I can't expect them to do everything for me. And another point is the observer is not there to. If I get lost, it's on me. Um, so they, they're just t trailing me. With, you know shadowing me and you know we don't when we get off the bus they you know they don't we're not supposed to be seen together because they don't want it obvious and another thing the observer does have to have good sight because they they take down the um bad number of the driver or the bus id and they also know if the overhead stop announcements are working so the next step is boarding the bus um i don't usually use the ramp but sometimes on the job i ask them to use the ramp because Sometimes the bus drivers say it doesn't work, and maybe it isn't, but sometimes it is lazy. So that would be a violation. So now I'm on the bus, and um, another issue is priority seating. Now, the bus driver, there are a lot of nice bus drivers out there. does not have to say, oh, there's a seat over there, or, but I have a right to ask for it. But I think a lot of people don't understand is that the bus driver does not have the power to say to force someone out of a disabled seat because they could have a hidden disability and the MBTA would probably get sued. As a matter of fact, the reason these jobs exist is because the Boston Center for Independent Living had a lot of issues with the MBTA and that's how this job came about. Um, so when you're on the bus, they have the um, stop announcements. Now, if the stop announcements aren't working, the bus driver is supposed to give you major connection points like the subway so you can get off the bus. But, of course, it's not all on the bus driver. Like, I can say, I want to get off at such and such such a stop, which I learned to do with experience because a lot of things come up sometimes. So, now, that a gray area would be, like, if the stop announcements were working, but I can still ask to get off at such and such a stop, if the bus driver said didn't tell me I was at my stop, but I heard the bus announcement, that might not be a clear violation of the ADA rules. But I was talking to Marcy earlier, and she said, she told the bus driver, I can't hear the stop announcement. Sometimes it's mechanical, sometimes the buses are really loud. And she told him specifically, and that's the key, especially if it's getting a violation on someone, is the more specific you are, the more ammo you have and less gray areas. And then there's the issue of getting off the bus. The bus drivers are always supposed to pull up at curbs, you know, so you, you don't have, you're not supposed to be walking five feet across. That's happened to me, and there was a crash can in the way. No biggie. I use my cane anyway. But that's a violation. 
and he was technically probably supposed to help me across. Those, those are the black and white rules. Um, I guess that's pretty much it for the buses. I've had a lot of interesting experiences. I've been let off on highways. I've had to cross highway bridges. And like I said, if I didn't have my mobility training, I would be freaking out. And sometimes it's still pretty scary. Now, the um, subway and commuter rail are pretty simple because you're just looking for stop announcements, and the observer can sit with me because, you know, the guys in the front, he won't really see you, you know, interact with them anyway, generally. So you're listening to stop announcements, and if the stop announcements aren't working, the person writing, whoever does the announcements, is supposed to tell you to stop. Now, sometimes there's a big issue <clears throat> with mechanical, you know, you can't hear the guy on the speakers, you just hear him click the mic, and I, and that that's... They look into the mechanical issue. If the attempt was made and there's a mechanical issue, it's not a violation. Um, let's see, where am I? Bus subway. Well, the social part of the job is really interesting. I think the most important, interacting with bus drivers and the general public. Um, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I get frustrated. People try to help you too much. They, they give you the wrong directions. But I feel my attitude as being confident and showing them I know what I'm doing I know where I'm going is a good example for anyone with a disability because if you have an angry disposition people are going to either get angry back or if you don't look like you're confident I learned that in mobility you have to have that confidence people are going to treat you like a person they'll say okay he wants to know where the XYZ is he knows what he's doing and then, like I said sometimes there's people that really They'll grab your arm, they'll grab your cane. And, yeah, it's frustrating, but I just pull away and say thank you. And, like, last week, I was an idiot. I went out in the – well, it wasn't so bad when I went out last Thursday. And I got to South Station. The weather was getting really bad, and my observer called me, and she said, well, play it by ear. And then I got to Kendall Square, and I was like, there's no way. This this weather is ridiculous. And I went back home, and I had they hadn't plowed, and but I got paid for two hours just putting the effort in anyway. But so basically, I think we have to have we have rules, and we have all these ADA things, and there are some gray areas. But I think it's on us too. You know, it's not just that we expect people to. Oh, I forgot to mention that when when there are violations, and I might like write a report that they left me at the curb or whatever. It's not. You know, I used to joke around and say, like, I'm an NBTA cop, but really the job of when they tell a bus driver is to educate them. Now, if it's a bus driver or something that is chronically, you know, not doing what they're supposed to, then, then yeah, that's an issue. But it's it's more of an educational role, and I like getting paid to use my, to keep my mobility skills sharp, and I really enjoy the job because... No matter what I think of the route, you just never know what's going to happen. It's, it's exciting meeting people, chit-chatting, educating people, and talking about, you know, just seeing the pulse of the community. And and I really, um, now as far as the ride, I don't really have any, I do take the ride as well, but I don't really know the ins and outs of their ADA issues, so I can't just let you know right away, I can't really answer specific questions on that. But, uh, again, I want to thank you all for um, tuning in, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. All right. Let's open the floor. Steve, Anyone? I think you're – yes, I want to say something to Steve. I think you're very brave to do what you do. Oh, thank you, Joni. I appreciate that. I, I had forgotten to put that in my notes. Um, I, I I don't disagree with you, but I think I I don't like people. Um, you know, if I didn't have mobility, I'd be brave. I mean, I I, I appreciate the compliment, but I I really was going to say that. Um, I I'm sick of the people that not you personally, but in general, the people are like, oh wow, that's wonderful. It's like I don't. I'm not Superman. I'm not Stevie Wonder. I'm just doing a job which I happen to enjoy, and if it wasn't for the mobility, um, I, you know, but I appreciate that, though. Thank you. 
Well, I think uh, the reason why I said it is because you are so good with your mobility skills, and I have. Um, they told me years ago that I was a point-to-point traveler, and I always got where I was going. But um, if I didn't know exactly, exactly where I was going, I really would get lost. So I just guess I admire anybody that's a good traveler. Well, thanks, but I, I, um, I'm definitely not. I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm getting better, but I know people who like, you know, I, get, I've gotten lost a few times, and I have to figure out what am I doing. And I'm kicking myself, saying, oh, "Remember, was it taught you at the Carroll Center?" And I am getting better, so maybe, you know, it, like I said, it's a good way to keep my skills up. It's doing the job anyway. But there's always improvement, and I think that mobility is important. But I think the orientation is the biggie, especially on this job, because I don't know half the routes on the T. I don't know all the T. So I have to really pay attention. Steve, in regards to the job itself, is there a test that one has to take first before becoming a tester? No. I guess, you know, I answered the right questions at the interview, and I, I suppose if it was an I, I was able to convince them that I could do it. And I guess the real test is you're, when you're on the job, and if they say you can't do it, I'm sure you don't last very long. I'm sure no, there's, no, there's no, no specific test. It was an over an hour interview, and they were, I'm sure they ask you what knowledge you have of the ATA itself. Yeah, a little bit, but they that, they do a lot more of that in the training because I didn't, I had no idea about like announcements and what they're supposed to do and should do. Um, so they really do, indo- I shouldn't say that, they teach you the. Um, what you're supposed to be doing, and as long as you keep, have a clear head, I think it's doable, you know. And you're learning all the time. That's what I mean. It's not it's like this simple black and white. We're going down the list because some things are gray areas. Like I was taking a bus once, and I said that he wasn't parallel to the curb, and, and then my observer was like, well, "That's because he was pulling out." So sometimes the observers will help you a little because, especially in unfamiliar areas. But 99% of the stuff is doing it myself I mean there are times when I will you know I do defer to the observer especially some when we come to some of those crazy highways it's like okay we can cross now and I'm still listening but it's like well I don't think he wants to get killed with me so I'll trust you Steve it's yeah. Bo Dane. I just want to know how much vision you have <clears throat> I'm very low partial one eye I've always seen out of one eye it's very variable but okay. generally it's in the 24 500 area Oh, okay. And sometimes it's like it can be twenty eight hundred. It depends on the not even the day or the minute. But you're not a, a retinopathy of prematurity person. No, I had glaucoma cataract, and now I have corneal edema, okay. which is why okay. the vision's all over the place. I think yep. that there's a real difference, and this 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 is in line with what Joni said about being a root circumscribed traveler. Um, mm. For people with ROP, mm-hmm. um, they have real, a lot of them do, I know I do, um, a lot of us have real difficulty with spatial concepts. And oh, yeah. because, because of that, um, mobility, math, geometry, algebra, all that gunk, uh, writing your signature, a lot of these kinds of things are really, really tough. And that's related to the ROP specifically, then? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. That that makes sense, yep. Well, because we don't know what happened to us when we were in the incubator, uh, depending on how long, and what did that oxygen do to our abilities to, um, with traveling and math and that kind of thing. That makes sense. And a lot of people, nobody ever understood when I said that I thought, that it had something to do with my ROP because I was in the incubator for three months or three and a half months or something ridiculous like that. Me yep. too. Me too. Three months in the hospital. And the only reason they let me home was because my mother was a nurse. Yeah. It was the only oh. reason they let me home. Oh, Actually, I, I heard about that. Um, they were talking about a study that they had to shut down or they were doing experiments on the a proper amount of oxygen for preemies, and 
I guess um, they had signed people sign stuff without knowing they were in one of the test groups. And, yeah, there's a very fine line of too much oxygen, not enough oxygen. Yeah. Well, there was, there was a doctor do- named Dr. Arnold Patz from, mm-hmm. now, wait a minute, is it Baltimore, Joni? I think I don't know. Was. I never heard that name. You never heard that name? Okay. Yeah. And he was a, he was the doctor who discovered that that was the culprit, that it was the oxygen mm-hmm. that, that messed everybody yeah. up. Because yeah. there was a whole sliggity of people back in the, the the late 40s, early 50s that were ROP. Well, it kind of did. I mean, I was I was told that I was the third one in the country. I was born in 39. Wow. Oh yeah, you were early. Oh yeah, man. Because I'm I'm 10 years 10 years your junior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there were. Yeah, I have another question for you. You said that you report all of your findings. In your estimation, how much of a percentage of the reporting that you do, that you know of, has a positive ending? Uh, that, that's hard to um, I Like I said, I, as from what I know and what they tell me, that they really try to work with the drivers and educate them. And, you know, and it, it seems to come in waves, like, like, I was on the job for, like, maybe six weeks. So we're not getting very much, many violations, which is good. But some one day we got three in a row, so I had to write it all up. You know, we, I, I write, I don't write the full report like the observer does everything, like what time I got on the bus, what time I, but, like, if I had to cross the street because the bus didn't pull up, I would write. So we, so we get some kind of consensus. Um, I would imagine it's going to have an effect because it did come about from a lawsuit. So I think... The attorney, because they had a meeting, we had a meeting about a year back about how they were going to proceed with the, you know, testing and all that. So I definitely think, especially with his lawyers involved, they they really want to be proactive with, and not in a punitive way, but just in just general education. And, you know, he has his problems like anything else, but I think they're getting a lot better. I think the further out of the like, cities you go, the worse it is. But, but then again, I took a, um, bus to Canton Center, and the bus driver was very good because they had no stop announcements or anything, and she was like, where do you want to get off? Are you going inbound or outbound? Some of them go above and beyond the call of duty, and of course, the bad ones make it, uh, the percentage, I don't know, I couldn't, I think it's pretty good overall. Um, I, I couldn't give you a number, though. Steve, how are they, um, um, I don't mean punished, but how are they when they have violations, what kind of well? I I guess punishment is the word I want to use. What do they get for if they? Um, I'm not sure exactly, but I know the bus drivers, of course, are trained in the beginning about that stuff, and so they probably remind them. And I think it depends, probably, like when they call them on the carpet, how they respond, and you know, it's like I'm sorry and. You know, I've heard stories that some, like some bus drivers, like I know what you're doing here, and I know you're look checking up on me. But generally, I don't think they know. You know, if they had a violation, like one violation, and they said, "Oh, you, you took a blind guy and you left him acro- ten feet from the curb," if they see us on that route again, which they don't usually do routes, you know, they mix it up so that, but they'll be like, "Yeah, he's, he must have been the one because he's the only blind guy in the bus." But if you have that kind of attitude, they, they're not gonna. Uh, um, but yeah, they can lose their jobs if it's, like I said, I don't know how many times. I think it really depends on how they communicate with their bosses. I, I don't know if they do like three strikes or out, or mm-hmm. I think it's a case by case kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Steve, I got a question for you. Sure, Karen. How do you find, I, I take the commuter rail a great deal, and how do you find most of the commuter rail lines. I know sometimes the one I take announces stops, sometimes they don't. Yeah, uh, it's more than 50-50 is pretty good most of the time, but when it's not, of course. Um, that reminds me last week, I don't remember where I was going with the commuter rail. We missed the train, so we had to re- redo the route because um, we weren't at the platform, but I, 
I don't know. I know it, the observer reported it, but I don't know if it ended up being a violation or we weren't at the platform at exactly the right time and they would have left anyway, whether I was blind or not. So those are the areas where that's why they take all the information. Um, I think the further out you go, generally, the worse it is because that was a, I, like I said, I forgot the route, but it was, you know, going way out of the city and they weren't announcing the stops and the bus, the conductor said to stop and he, we couldn't hear him and he, like he wasn't really, I mean, some of these conductors are great. They're like, yeah, ruggles, ruggles. And you hear the announcement. It's like, wow. And then sometimes they're too loud. <laughs> but, but that's not, that's another issue. But, uh, I, I, I'm thinking in my experience generally, like I said, there are exceptions, but, the further away from the center of the T you go, the worse it is because, you know, let's face it, there probably aren't too many people with disabilities doing that. You know, there are some going to work or whatever, but it's not a common. But in Boston proper and that, those areas, you're going to see a lot. You know, they're more used to it. Like South Station, they're great because they really, you know, it's a big center and there's a lot more visibility with us in, in, in the, those areas. Uh, Steve, this is Leonore. Um, yeah, Leonore. I used to ride the bus a lot, I mean, for many years here in Denver. And yep. supposedly we have a very fine bus system here. <laughs> I wasn't sure about that, but okay, if they say so. Um, but I have to say that I have never, I mean, we and I've, and I've seen plenty of disabled people riding, you know, I mean, with canes mm -hmm. or, you know, dogs in wheelchairs, whatever. Yep. Um, but um, I have never seen anybody doing what I would guess was was checking on things like that and I, I wonder if you know um, how many such testers there are I mean is that common to have um, I don't know about other um, they're not supposed to know I'm doing that you might I mean they could you, you never know I don't know if, like I said the Denver system but it's it's possible someone has a dog and they're doing a checkup on the you know I don't know if they're doing that in other systems but i think it'd be a great idea to do it so nationwide it wouldn't be obvious that they were checking no because i'm just i'm just traveling they don't know you know if they saw my my route they'd be suspicious because it goes in a big circle and what are you doing but they don't know that so they 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 don't know that that's the whole idea they, they're not supposed to know you're checking up on them because then, then they'll be on their best behavior so i'm just a guy taking a bus the observer either gets on before me, after me. He usually sits in the back. Um, so they don't, they're not supposed to know, and I think most of the time they don't know that you're doing a checkup. So it's possible that they could be doing it. Huh, yeah, well, that's really interesting. Now, I have in the past seen somebody sitting, like, with a clipboard, you know, writing things down, but they were sitting like up near the front of the bus, right near the driver, and I, I always kind of assume I never talked to such a person, so I didn't know, but I just assumed that maybe they were checking up on a new driver or something like that. that. Yeah, that could be that, because the um, observer, like I said, is usually in the back, and he has an iPad, so it's not as obvious. They don't want to make it too obvious, because someone was saying, why can't you be an observer? And I said, well, I don't have to cite for it, and they said, well, couldn't you just ask for his badge ID in the bus? ID and I said that would then they'd know they were something was up so that's yeah. why the observers at least have to have good eyes and another thing I hadn't mentioned was that I think for someone deaf blind I don't know of anyone that's do on the, on our team that's doing that it would be a cha big challenge for public transportation wow yeah I should think so but I just wanted to make the general comment that I think what you're doing is extremely important <laughs> Um, and, you know, before before I learned about your job, you know, when I was first working with you on, on your book and stuff, I, I had no idea that there were people doing that kind of thing. And I, I think that's just great. I really do. I think that's very important. Thanks. I, I think it's important, too, I mean, because it's not going to just improve having the ADA. It's, it has to be – we have to be proactive, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I, I Okay, we we'll either got time for a few more. Marcy, you have a question we haven't heard from you yet. Gloria? 
Lauren? Betsy? I have a question. Sure. Betsy? Um, yeah. I, uh, something else in your bio said you also do some independent testing for for companies. Yeah, like somewhat. Uh, accessibility reps? Yeah, yeah, they, a lot of times, uh, um, especially through the Carroll Center, they'll have either school or Fidelity or I think they some university. And I basically go in and use JAWS and basically say how, you know, where the problems are on their website. So they document those. So that's another important, the technology is another important, you know, of course I have a lot of technological background, but I, it's, it's always good to, uh, see the latest and that it's good to see that companies are interested in the issues with the um, ADA. And yeah, I that, that really got my attention because, uh, you know, I wondered if there was a market for something like that out there and, you know, may, maybe more and more aware of, awareness of that that's going on might, might help that grow into something. Well, they do have even, because I'm not a, like, uh, I'm more of like a tester in that field too because I'm you know, as a regular user, but they have college degrees and accessibility, stuff like that. Like I knew a person at the Carroll Center who was teaching the technology, and his de his degree was in, like, accessibility and stuff like that. So there is, like, a niche market. I mean, it's not a big thing, and I think the big thing with that is talking with companies and making things more accessible. Right. But it sure is, like, not in, like the old days. <laughs> Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> well, thanks for answering that. I was most curious about that. Yep. Now, Steve, do they assign the route to you, or do you pick your own route? No, they assign. I don't know how they – I'd like to be in on one of those, how they figure out the rules, because they're very, I don't know what you say, convoluted, because it's like, – nobody would ever do that in, in real life, you know, because they're like, I'll be in Chelsea, and then I'll be – go to Harvard Square, and then I might go to Arlington, and – we always kind of end up where we start, so, you know, they try to get me in the SL station, which I appreciate, so I, I don't have, you know, because I've already worked. So I, I might meet them uh, uh, anywhere, but, yeah, they assign, they assign the routes, and like I said, I don't know how they, I think they do try to find where there are issues, because a couple times routes come up, a couple times, you know, it's like, oh, I've done this one before. So I, I think they're looking for a specific, you know, where there have been problems before and they want to see if it's fixed. But there are an awful lot of routes. And they're they're not random, but they're convoluted. It's, I'd have, I was going to read it, but it, if you haven't taken the tea, it would be very boring. Steve. Yeah. We, we were talking earlier, you know, when uh, you took the route and you took the 34E and everything. Oh, yeah. So yeah. did you find, did you find as you, went, like you said earlier, as you go out further, as long, the further you took the 34E almost to the end, didn't yeah. you find it a little bit more rural and it didn't do as much announcing? Uh... Uh, actually, I, I don't think I, I really had a problem with the 34E that time, but sometimes, yeah, like I said, that train, we were way out, and they didn't announce them, and, but of course, sometimes, even in city routes, they don't do the announcing, or the, or the worst thing is the bus driver doesn't know what route they're doing. It's like I wanted, because one time I wasn't paying. What's you know, that? It's the same thing with the orange line, when you, they don't do all the announcing until they get to a certain point, like they get to uh, Rubble, then they'll make the announcement. Yeah, well, if you're coming out, yeah, I don't know if that's, yeah, that's a good point. Um, the orange line is the worst as far as route announcements on the subways, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really a, I don't know, I, I think it is the oldest yeah, because they don't have the automated on there, so the yeah. guy's always supposed to um, announce them. So. Well, like we, like we were talking earlier, I, I hate Forest Hills. Oh, the station, yeah, the station layouts are another. Um, we don't really go into the 
how accessible the stations are. Yeah. But I'm sure, I don't know who plans those, because, yeah, far, the buses used to be so you could get the bus in the subway. You didn't have to walk right. toward a mile. Well, maybe not uh-huh. that far, but, yeah, I don't like the setup of that station either. Uh-huh. Or, or I'm not crazy about Ruggles either. I don't like Ruggles. I don't, I don't like Forest Hills. And I definitely don't like Harvard Square. Oh, no. That's sure has changed. But catching a bus there is one of the hardest because they have to all line up. And... Uh-huh. Yep. That's where I like... Kendall Square isn't such a picnic either anymore. No, that's a seedy area. That That's another thing. Some of these areas are like, I, I don't want to be here, but they don't usually yeah. do it at night, so it's that's a help. Uh-huh. Yeah, you you don't really like hanging around those areas. Nope. Especially Maybe. far. Yeah, I know. I got a question. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. How much have you done with going towards the South Shore, like Quincy, Braintree, Wollaston? Uh, I've I've done Braintree. I haven't done a lot, but they do. They could. They have Route Solo. I could. They, like he's, I said, they, oh, yeah. they could go anywhere. Um, Fitchburg. That's the other side. But um, have you ever done that? Oh. No, not yet. Maybe. Maybe that's a good sign that they're not having. Of course, they do have other testers and stuff. So. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm sure after I'm there, I'll, like they said, I've been here a few years. You'll know the whole tea like the back of your hand, <laughs> and. I'm getting there, but it's there's still. A, I never realized how many buses, bus routes they had. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, Steve, um, I'm sorry, but I have to leave right now. So that's okay. Thank, I'm glad you came in, Joni. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad I did too. I um, got an idea of of what you do now. Thanks. Just take care. You too. How many testers do you think the MBTA currently has? They have about eight. And they only have three observers. That's why if they had more observers, I could probably work a lot more hours. They were trying to recruit more observers. They had one. It didn't work out for some reason. I didn't ever have them. And then there was one that was supposed to come back. So we only have like three observers right now. But the good thing with that is the observers get to work at you know Monday through Friday. So, well, actually, some people even work Saturday. So, if you both you you tell them what days you're available, and that's how they do your schedules. So, if you want to work Saturday and Sunday, and the observer wants to work Saturday and Sunday, you can. Although technically, I'm not a, an MBTA employee. I'm a, um, I work for a temp agency. So I guess that way they don't have to give me, like, benefits and stuff like that. But the pay makes up for that anyway, so I don't have any problems with that. Well, Steve, um, I, I was going to ask how many hours, about usually how many hours a week do you work? Uh, usually 8 to 12 like, right now because I usually get at least one day a week. It's like I said, it's, it's four to six hours generally. So if I get two, it could be 8 to 12. Uh-huh. But right right now, that's a good fit for me because it's giving me time to do some writing and other things. So yeah. I'm happy where I am. Part time jobs are great for people <laughs> for people who are also writing. Absolutely, because if I was working full time, I mean, I'd get it written eventually. But at least this way, I think um, I'll go a little faster. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do do you? Um, I mean, I'm not sure you said this along the line. Do you do you enjoy the work overall? Yeah, I really do because it's like it's not boring. You know, I might have taken the route before, but it's like you you don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know. It's not always good, but it's I'm all, I always feel good after I'm done. I was like, wow, that's that's interesting. Um, even last Thursday, although I probably shouldn't have went out, even though I got paid for two hours, um, I'll never do that again because that's a little too much, but. It was just, un- I didn't know what to expect. But they said, you better go home before they, you know, they shut the tea down, which they didn't. So that would have been bad. <laughs> uh-huh. um, also, 
does it ever happen that that somebody you know doesn't realize what you're there doing and and you know gets you engaged in conversation and gets you distracted from what you're supposed to be um, do? Is that a problem? Yeah, that, that, it's not a big problem. Um, I I have had that happen. Um, after the day I missed the stop, um, and they did announce it. I just I I think I was daydreaming. I wasn't even in a conversation. And we went to the end of the line, and that was the time the bus driver didn't know. I said, can, I, can you stop at such, you know, there's was, was two street intersection. He didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, I have to catch the number one bus. You, you know, and it, it, it did let me off at the, you know, so that's where you have to think on your feet. So, so we're going to do the next leg of the journey. He doesn't know I want to get off at whatever and whatever. But I think fast. I said, well, I need to catch the number one bus. And he, he did know that, which was good. So, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy the challenge. I enjoy being a part of the system where you, we're going to be helping, hopefully, down the end, making things better. I really do enjoy it. Some, there are some days it's like I don't really want to go to work, and I'm like, why Why don't you want to go to work? You always feel so, so good when you come home that you've done something that I really enjoy doing. Well, that's great that you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I've never, yeah. you know, thought I would enjoy doing something this much. Well, it sounds both, I mean, to me, it does sound interesting. I mean, like, it's real detail work. You know, you really have to be paying attention. And, yep. uh, you know, but but re- really interesting, too, and, and uh, challenging, you know, challenging and interesting at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I just think it's great that you're doing something like that. And I, and I would be curious to know if they have people doing that here in Denver. I used to have a student. He was one of my German students, and um, he he worked for um, RTD here, you know, the bus service here. And I should email him and ask him if if uh, you know if they have that here. Yeah, that's a good question because I I I wonder like like New York would be a challenge, but because I, I don't know the system, but I, I I'm sure I don't know. Like I said, if, if they do that, but. It's a, I think it would be a great idea to have it nationwide if they don't already. Mm-hmm. But like I said, this is more was as a result of a lawsuit, so I hope I hope they weren't all getting sued. They, this has been going on for like eight years or nine years they've been doing this, and I don't know if that means there's an end in sight because, you know, if it's under what the terms of the situation are, like if this job will be permanent or I could ask it reminds me to call and ask them that question because it is the result of a uh, litigation so I I could see maybe in the future it might come to an end or maybe they'll just continue doing it just to make sure the tea is getting better uh-huh yeah well those are all interesting questions that I'll have to ask my friend about here yeah um, let me know yeah because um I don't know. I the the only problems, the main problems I had when I was riding the bus was I think they often just let too many people on the bus. Period. You know. And I oh yeah, that that can be a real really overcrowded. Um, yeah. They're not well, supposed to do that, but you know. Uh, that did. brings me to uh, that reminds me of I had I guess I did forget. Um, they we have to do deal with drive bys. Now I don't usually know if the bus is crowded, but it's a case where the bus is crowded. The driver's supposed to say you'll either have to wait for the next bus, or and they're supposed to call the office and say we have a person with a disability that will make sure they get on the bus. And technically, and this never happens, though very rare, they're supposed to let a person with a visible disability, unless if you don't have one, you tell them. But on the bus before everyone else gets on, but I mean the bus driver can't really control the crowd, so. A lot of times I'm just, you know, a lot of people will give me this priority seating, but sometimes you're kind of on your own and you just get on the bus when you get on. Mm-hmm. Like I said, most of the time they don't even enforce that rule, so. Yeah. And well, it, it would be hard to enforce. Are pretty, they are pretty good about that here. I mean, they, you know, they let down the ramp and they, they let anybody in a wheelchair on. on the yeah. Bus. And uh, there is priority seating, but some jerks will sometimes take it, you know, and I have seen altercations, you know, over oh, yeah. being, being being jerks, you know. Yeah. But uh, in general, I think they do have a pretty good system here for, you know, like the ramps and, and the priority seating, but not everybody obeys the rules, and, and I would I would see, you know, drivers, some being kind of lax about it and some being yeah. stricter. Yeah. Um, 
So I guess that's the kind of thing you need to look out for. I mean, yeah, when you're doing that's things. exactly what we're doing, yep. Yeah. yeah. Now there on the on the bus, you, you talked about, I think you mentioned something like a, a sign at the front of the bus that would that would say the next stop. You, you have yeah, there's, there's a sign that's LED or whatever, and it shows it, and they announce the – now, do they announce the stops in, in Denver, like, say, you know, such and so street or the okay. mall? Um, but it, but we did at least – now, I, I stopped riding the bus some yeah. few years ago, a few years ago. But there were some of the newer buses then that did have the lighted signs, which was which was great, you know. Yeah, but did they do the spoken announcements? Yeah, some, but no, most of the most of the drivers were not very good about that. But whether they were supposed to do it or not, I really don't know. Well, under the ADA, they're not supposed to, but. Yeah, well, some did, some did. Yeah. I, I appreciated that. Oh, yeah. Because I would get lost in what I was doing, <laughs> you know, reading. That, that's the funny thing, because I'm like, you can read the sign, but, uh, you know, I suppose that I wasn't, if I was sighted, I wouldn't be thinking, unless I knew somebody that was blind, I wouldn't be thinking of that issue at all, you know, because people are like, oh, that's interesting, and that, I never thought of that, and because it's so, the yeah. visual thing takes over, it's like you're not listening for the stop, because say, I can read it, or I can look out the window, and I know where I am, so it's not as important. Yeah, exactly, I would usually just look out the window, you know, to see where yeah. it was. But uh, but that's why I think it is extremely important to have the sign and the and the verbal announcement, you know. Yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, they certainly varied in their quality. <laughs> the drivers. Yeah, yeah. We, we have. I think, like I said, generally it's good here. But you know, you, you never know. Yeah. yeah. So you ride. Anyone else? Ride. Do you ride buses and the, and the subway or just? Yeah, I could do one day. I rode the, you know, it's always usually mixed up. It's usually the buses is the biggest part of it because you have the most interaction with. But yeah, we do the subway, the commuter rail. The Silver Line is kind of like a bus, um, but um, yeah, we it's usually a combination. Uh huh. Like one day. Call. A what? Track with trolley. Oh yeah. Green line, the green line, you mean? No, the silver line is like it's like those big vans they have that they go to the airport, and some of them are like buses. Yeah. Do you, do you yeah, the green line, um, Steve? Oh yeah, I've done a couple on the green line. Yep. Oh, uh, I hate the green line. I do too. It's, is that it's, like a light rail? I like yeah, it. That's, that's exactly the term. It's light rail. That's that reminds me of my training. It says light rail. Yep. Yeah, we have that here in Denver, but it doesn't come out to where we live. Well, what is a light rail? Trolley <sighs> car. Oh, yeah, like, um, it's basically a trolley, really. I, yeah. Kind of. I mean, but they 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 can get going pretty fast. I mean, they call it. I mean, it's it's like a train, oh yeah, but yeah. Not that long. Here they're usually I don't know three to five cars long. Five yeah, that's about it. Yeah, it's something like yeah, that. Yeah, pretty big. They're pretty good size, and they you know they go on tracks and and um, you know yeah. they supposedly they're really really popular. I mean you know where they do go, and uh, they're faster than the bus. You know they make fewer stops and so on. Yeah. Have light well, that's kind of weird on the light rail because you like on the green line you have to stop for red lights and stuff and. Because the tracks go across streets and stuff, like uh, yeah, in the middle of the yeah. street. Yeah, right. so it's interesting. And lately here in Denver, there's been a problem with some of the expansion parts that they've been having trouble with the, what do they call it, the arms that go down, you know, to stop the traffic. Um, um, yeah, yeah. After a train, and they haven't been working right, which sounds hideously dangerous to me so far. Yeah, yeah. But, well, the D-line but on, is on the track. Yeah. Street track. Mm -hmm. What were you saying, Marcy? The D line. That's mm -hmm. pretty much the D line when you go um uh, when you go into Brookline. Yep. That's pretty on its own track. It doesn't have any streets or anything. No, no, you're going down that far, yeah. You just all the way. Yep. Are you talking about the one going to Riverside? Um Yeah. Yeah, that's the one, yep. Yeah, that's the one. I mean the that, that that can travel really fast, depending oh, on... Oh, it does. Yeah. Once they get out of the, that stretch, yep. Yeah. And it yeah. stops further and further apart. Even on all all of them, really, once you get out to 
like Forest Hills, the stops aren't as close. Even on the red line, start going further out, the stops are further apart. Yeah. And you're in the country yep. almost. Yeah. The only time the only time you have a problem on the D line is when the when the deer decides to cross it. Oh yeah. On the what? Deer. Deer? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, no, no, no. There's a section in Newton where there's a a, a deer farm like. Oh, uh-huh. oh, that must be something new. Yeah. Oh, it's been there for, for forever. Mm. But uh, well, I haven't taken the D line forever, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Steve, how much of what you do and what other people in your field do is known to the public? Uh, it's not publicly known, um, because it, it, it kind of it's it kind of cute. I was making it like, yeah, I'm an undercover. Um, you know, I um, the public really. I mean, I t- I tell people I know, but it, it's like I'm I'm telling people on the bus I'm going to work. I'm working now, but. I can't say oh, I'm working for the Emmy. Uh, well, I did tell one of the um, people that were helping me with the train. I said, you know, I do testing for the buses and stuff. And I said, you're doing a great job. And, you know, she said, oh, that's interesting, you know. But it's not real. I don't think the public, unless they know about the Boston Center suit, they aren't probably going to know anything about it. So I would you say you're working, and let's say they ask you in what capacity, what do you say? Oh, you mean you mean like on a bus or something? Yes. Oh, I I just then I talk about my web development, or I tell them I should bring some books with me in case that comes up in the future. Most <laughs> people don't say I'm ask me what I'm doing anyway. I mean, it's chit chat, but no, I definitely, especially if I'm in the priority seating, because the bus driver's going to hear me, and you know you it you can't tell them you know especially on the bus. I might tell someone somewhere else that what I'm doing, but if I'm on the yeah. bus or something, I'd just say, oh, I'm a writer, I'm a web tester. So it's good to So that that. when the MBTA gets these reports about violations, they don't know who's reporting them. Um, Actually, yeah, but that's that's through a higher channel. So that's like my boss coordinates the um, routes and stuff, and he has a person that's blind working in the office, too, that sends out all the... I mean, the driver who's violating, he doesn't know... Oh, no, the driver would not know. They would say you... you, No, they would not know anyone. They would just say we have a report, and they they wouldn't know it was us. You know, because anyone... Oh, I forgot to mention that. Anyone can report violations to to the... Well, the the T is um, system-wide accessibility office. So, or there's other numbers you can call. So... It, if if you know what a violation is, and like I said, I think I've outlined the basics, that you have a right to call them up and say, look, there's somebody violated the rules, and they might, I, I think they will take it serious, maybe not as seriously because it's more documented with us people, but you you definitely can, as a citizen, report those things, too, because that will make it better, too, if because there's not enough of us around to do it all the time, so... They really would appreciate that kind of feedback, as long as you're just saying, you know, this happened here. You, you know, if you don't know the bus and the time, you don't have to know the badge ID because they can usually find it anyway. But you say, I took the bus so and so at such and such time on such and such a date. They're gonna right. know who the driver is. So yeah, um, anyone can report violations. Yeah, remember that that day I told you I did that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, because yeah. you had mentioned, I said, you should report it, because it, it was a clear yep. violation. Yep. Yep. And, I mean, I, I'm lucky that I can see the ba- the, the driver's number, because right. that goes across the, the uh, thing. But even last week, my observer was like, I don't, I can't even find the um, driver's ID, and badge ID, and he said, but the, they'll, they'll know by the time and all that anyway. Yeah. If, you know, yeah, if they have that, it's easy to, you know, look it up, but they they can still get yeah. that information. So, yeah. Yeah. Most people don't, well, most people don't look up at, up, up at the sign, but it will say this bus is driven by someone yeah. going to the number. Right. I, I could never see that, but yeah. Yeah. Assuming it's working. But they're supposed to wear their badge ID on their... Uh, Uniform too. 
Some Fifty of them don't. I can't find it. Yeah, I know because it's not easy. Uh. Yeah. Okay, we got time for one or two more. Well, this is Lauren. I don't have a question. I just want to tell you, Steve. You can gave an excellent presentation. You explained everything thoroughly. I was very impressed. And I learned a lot about what you do and about the transportation. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, I'd like to check out the transportation in your area someday, but to see how to com compare the different systems would be kind of a neat kind of thing. Yeah, it would be very interesting. But, like, New York, that would be, even with online mobility, that would be a little scary, maybe a lot scary. Yeah. But, yeah, I could learn it. Once I know what train goes where and when, and I never thought I'd learn the T. Uh. But I always liked the T. I used to uh, sneak off Perkins when I was a kid and take <laughs> the T uh, if I ever got caught. <laughs> yep, you never did. <laughs> no, I was, but uh, the stats were just up on that. <laughs> I have one more question. Okay. Um, Go ahead. kind of light, but do you get breaks? Like you get coffee breaks and things? Well, not specifically, but we're going through the station, so we can. And there's a lot of times that we wait. There's a lot of waiting time, which is great when you're getting paid. Yeah, I like getting stuck in the bus in traffic. I, normally, I'd be like, I want to go home. It's like, hey, I, I hope we get stuck here a few hours, but that never happens. But no, we we usually can get something at the stations, or you know, if we're yeah. walking around. So they don't sp specifically give us break time because it's only like four to six hours right, but right. I grab I, like I'll always if it's an afternoon when I'll always grab lunch at South Station and go or you know yeah like one time I was I grabbed a cup of coffee so yeah um that's a good thing about that is you don't have to you know there's always something around unless you're way out in the yeah the boondocks but well if you ever come out to Fitchburg and if you ever come out I think it's before three there is a cafeteria there in the station. Yeah. Yeah, most of them have. But you, you know, can get lunch. Yeah. I'll be something. Not many people know about that, but it's, you know. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sharing your duties with us. And we, we've all learned a lot about what goes on on the tea and, and about uh, what the ADA allows and what it doesn't allow for accessible transportation. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Well, thanks for having me. No problem.